thank you for your promise that where two or three are gathered, that you are there as well. Lord, we welcome you amongst us today and celebrate the many gifts that you have given to each one of us. Lord, we pray for all those on our prayer list and we lift their names up to you. Lord, you know each one of their specific needs. Father, I pray for guidance for our leaders here in your church, as well as the country. Guide them, Lord, so that they make decisions that are pleasing to you. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we move into a time of giving our tithes and offerings, I just want to remind you that you can give in any of the ways that appear on the screen, um, or you can drop off your offering in the back of the box as you, in the back, and the new offering box as you leave today. I just want to thank you for your generosity as we use these gifts to minister to people in the name of Jesus. Well, as we continue a series uh, on the questions from Jesus, uh, what, and the question I have for us for this morning to get started is, what is the craziest weather you've ever driven in? Again, what is the craziest weather you've ever driven in? Of course, as you're thinking through that, uh, I know for me, I could probably give a bunch of different examples, but the one that might be the craziest for me happened while I was in college. I was just starting a six-month internship at a church out in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, back in June of 2006. It was an 18-hour drive from Chambersburg to Cedar Rapids, and I'd already driven from Chambersburg to Huntington, Indiana the day before. So I got through half the journey the day before, but as I head on out from Huntington, Indiana to go to Iowa, it was a beautiful, sunny, and calm day. And I set the drive through Indiana and through Illinois, and I do have to say, if you've ever been through Illinois, it is absolutely the worst state to drive through. Uh, once I got by Chicago, it was nothing but flatness and cornfields. So boring, so boring. I couldn't wait to get to my destination. Well, I finally got through that boring, boring state and drove into Iowa, which the, actually the border of Iowa on this side is the Mississippi River, so that, so that was really cool to drive over that. And the, but the beautiful, as I drove through into Iowa, the beautiful sunny day started to disappear. You know, dark clouds started to fill up the sky, and the, the sun disappeared amongst the clouds. Not only did the sun disappear, but the wind picked up, and it definitely was not calm anymore. It looked like I was about to drive into a possible thunderstorm. You know, at first, I was fine. I've driven in thunderstorms before, but then something ahead of me caught me off guard. One of the clouds looked like it was starting to rotate and turn into a funnel. And my thoughts went to, is that thing going to turn into a tornado? And if that thing turns into a tornado, I am going to die. <laughs> Again, that is my thoughts going through my head. I was terrified. Again, we don't get tornadoes out here in PA very often. I never really saw one while in college in Indiana, even though we had warnings and such. I became just a tad bit frightened for my life there right on the interstate in Iowa. Well, as I kept driving, that funnel cloud disappeared, and the clouds seemed to disappear, and the sun came back out. Uh, honestly, I don't even remember if it rained at all. I ended up having a beautiful drive the rest of the way to Cedar Rapids. But even though it ended up being nothing, I was still quite afraid as I entered into that, that storm. 
And when we enter into the storms of life, it is so easy for us to be afraid, isn't it? When things go wrong around us, it is so easy for us to lose our focus and be fearful of what might happen. But for us that are Christ followers, why is it so easy for us to be afraid? If you were here last week, we started a three-week series on the questions from Jesus. Jesus was the master at asking questions. And he's recorded to have asked 307 questions in the four Gospels. Jesus was ruthless about getting to the heart of people. He asked questions to provoke transformation in people's lives. He asked questions for awareness. He asked questions to confront the listener with their, their own thought process, preconceptions, assumptions, and beliefs. Ultimately, he asked questions in order to help people turn their lives back to him. And he does the same for us today. So during these three weeks, we're focusing on just three questions that Christ asks of us and on how those answers to those questions affect our lives as Christians. Last week, we looked at the story of the man who was an invalid for 38 years in John chapter 5. And Jesus asked this man who couldn't move, do you want to, to get well? We learned in the story this man placed his hope in this pool to heal him. And Jesus asked him this question, do you want to, to get well in order to redirect his hope from this pool to the only one who can actually heal him? That was him. That was Jesus. And Jesus asked the same question to us today, too. Do you want to get well? If so, don't place your th hope in the things that are around you, a job, a comfortable life, money, a solid relationship. Place your hope in Jesus, the only one who can make us well. Well, this week we're going to dig into the story of the disciples getting caught into a literal storm and Jesus asking them the question, the important question, why are you so afraid? So Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41 is our text for this morning. From Mark 4, 35 through 41. So feel free to turn there in your Bibles, smartphones. Of course, you can follow along with the screen too. But before we read this passage, let, let me give you some of the context of what's going here on Mark chapter 4. We're going to see Jesus was actually teaching from a boat. And maybe the boat's pulled up on the shore and you've got a lot of people gathered around. And he says to his disciples, let's leave the crowd and go to the other side of the sea. And the boat, which was kind of his pulpit, uh, is about to become his sermon illustration. So with that in mind, let's dive into Mark chapter 4. And we'll read just a couple verses at a time, and I'll give some, some observations, and we'll keep moving through this, this story. And here's what Mark uh, Gospel says, starting with verse 35. It says, That day when evening came, he, which is Jesus, said to the disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. A furious squall, squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been in a boat that uh, you thought was going to sink before. Uh, you know, I haven't been, but I know that would have freaked me out. Or maybe you've been in a plane where there's been massive turbulence, and you think it might crash. And there in that moment of freak out, you're just saying, oh God, please help me out. And so this is the kind of situation where they're thinking, the disciples are thinking, this is the end. There's massive panic. We're going to drown is what they're thinking at this moment. So in verse 38, Jesus says, uh, it, it says, Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion, which is for some reason very, very funny to me. They're thinking that they're going to drown, and Jesus is taking a cat nap. So, again, that's just always something that's funny to me. But then continue on with the story. The disciples, they woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? You know, he's saying, Guys, I'm on the boat. You've seen me do some great things. Why are you freaking out? And then he says, do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And the question that we're looking at today is, why are you so afraid? 
Well, I did a lot of research on this text, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm a meteorologist at all, and I don't claim to be one, but what I discovered through my research is that the, the Sea of Galilee, which is where this story is taking place, is about 680 feet below the sea level, and it's surrounded by all these mountains. And so according to experts, this is the perfect place for a storm to blow up out of nowhere. It's very, very common for a storm to explode into the Sea of Galilee with very little warning at all, kind of like my experience in Iowa that I shared earlier. It can be a very beautiful day, and then out of nowhere, boom, just a a massive storm can hit. And what's interesting is, as, as you go through life, sometimes life can be good and so normal, and then out of nowhere, using this as a metaphor, some storm just comes into your life. It could be you're having the best sales month of your career, and then you find out your company's laying people off. And because you're one of the newest people on the team, you realize your number is probably up. Out of nowhere, things were great, and then boom, you could be out of a job. It could be your, your marriage is better than ever it ever has been, and you think, man, you're, we're finally smooth sailing. And your spouse goes to the doctor to check something out, and suddenly you, you get horrible news. It just comes out of nowhere, and you feel like the rug's been pulled out from under you, and you don't know how you're going to make it. Or you think your child's doing great. You know, you prayed so much, and you work with your child. You think, okay, they're finally on the right track, and then you find out the truth. And suddenly, your child is making bad decisions. It it just doesn't matter what else is going on in your life. Everything zeroes in on that, and you find that you're in the middle of a storm. In fact, what's always interesting to me is that church people are sometimes the best at hiding the storms that they're in. And some of you, maybe even right now, you look totally fine, but behind your smile, you're in the middle of a storm, and maybe nobody even knows about it. In fact, I've seen times when people are jealous of other people going, man, I wish I had their life. I wish I lived in that house. And you're thinking, you know, I'm actually two payments behind on this house, and I may lose this house. And nobody even knows the private storm that I'm going through. Sometimes people look on and say, man, I I wish I had that marriage like that. I mean, they seem to get along so good, so well. And you're thinking, you know, you have no idea. We can fake it all on the outside, but on the inside, man, we barely are even hanging on by a thread. Sometimes you look good on the outside and nobody else would know that you go to sleep afraid. You cry yourself to sleep. You feel more alone. Even the pressure of a lot of good things, sometimes it just feels like way, way too much. Even though you're blessed in all different ways, you think there's no way I can keep going on this pace. And so you put on a smile, and yet on the inside you're in a storm, and nobody, nobody knows about it. I wonder how many of us would say right now that you or somebody close to you is in the middle of a storm in your life. It could be a big one, it could be a small one, it could be one that could be coming up possibly, it could be in the life of someone near that you love. So many of us so often in our lives are in the middle of things that we just didn't see coming and would never, ever, ever choose. What I want to do today is from this story, as Jesus asks this piercing question, I want to show you specifically two things to remember when you're in the storm, two things to remember and embrace when you're in the storm in your life. The first one is that you are in the storm with his presence. You're in the storm with the presence of a good God. It says in verse 37 and 38, shows us that a a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. But we see in verse 38 that Jesus was where? Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Where was Jesus? Jesus was in the stern. Jesus was in the boat. Here's what, here's what happens so often to us. I believe a lot of people think, okay, wait a minute. If I'm with Jesus, then there shouldn't be a storm at all in my life. I gave my life to Christ, therefore it should be smooth sailing for the rest of my life. And I need to tell you that's just not true. In fact, Jesus says this. He says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus never promised if you come to him, a life would be easy 
and it'll be storm free. In fact, the reality is often the opposite. When you move from darkness to light, suddenly you step into the middle of a spiritual battle. You see, Christianity is not a playground, but a battleground between forces of darkness and forces of light. And when you step onto the side of light, suddenly darkness is against you, and you'll face opposition, and you'll face temptation, and there'll be spiritual warfare. And to think, just because I'm with Jesus, nothing should go wrong, is actually a distortion of the message of the gospel. In fact, God never ever promises you that just because Jesus is on the boat that storms will never rock you. What he promises is the storm will never ever sink sink you. Because God is for you and God is with you. And there's nothing that that can take you out of the presence of God. Jesus was in the stern. He was on the boat. And that is a total game changer. In fact, I read this really interesting article again. Go with me on this one. Uh, You'll see where the point is once I get to the end of this thing. But I read an interesting article that talked about how people actually live longer if there's something else living in their house. You know, a person lives longer when there's anything else living in the house, anything at all. It could be another person. It could be a houseplant, a fern. It could be a cute dog, a little lap dog. It could be a big, ugly dog. It could be a goldfish. It could be a ferret. It could be a gerbil. It could be a hamster. Again, I don't know what the difference between those two are, but either of them can help. Uh, It could be a hedgehog. Uh, Some research claims that could even be certain kinds of cats. I'm not sure if that part is true since I'm not a big fan of cats, but, but whatever. But anyways, this research shows that people live longer when there's something living inside the house. Well, every now and then, some of you, you're going to be in the middle of a storm, and it's going to get really, really bad. And people are going to look on on you and say, how are you getting through that? How are you enduring through this? How come your world's, you know, falling apart, and yet you're not falling apart? How come everything's going wrong, and yet you still have this quiet confidence? Why is it that you're in the middle of the storm and there's this this deep assurance? Why is it that you have had this this peace in the middle of the storm? And what you're going to be able to tell them is that because there's someone living in my house. You see, there's something in the house, and that's not just life, but it's the author of life himself. You see, his presence is with me. Jesus is in the boat, and he's in my house. And because he is with me, I can sense his strength, I can sense his presence, I can sense his power, and I can sense his comfort because he is with me. He is in the boat with me. Just because I'm in a storm doesn't mean that he's not with me. Again, something important for us to remember when we're in the storm is that never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. Again, let me me say that again. Never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. You know, a great tool to help us remember this is actually the personalized scripture. For example, you can take something like Psalm 46.1 and personalize it. You can say, you know, God is my refuge. He is my strength. He is my ever-present help in a time of trouble. He is with me in the storm. Or you can take Hebrews 13.5 and it says, never will my God leave me. Never will he forsake me. Or another great one is Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you see, I'm not staying there, but I'm walking through. And when I'm walking through, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God is with me. Again, he never ever promised that the storm wouldn't rock you. He promised that the storm would not sink you. You see, he's in my house. He's on the boat. I'm not alone in the middle of the storm, and I pray that you find comfort no matter what you're going through, that you are in the storm with his presence. The second thing I want us to remember is that that you're in the storm for his purposes. You're in the storm with his presence, and you're in the storm for his purpose. Just think about this. In this story, Jesus said, let's go to the other side. So whose idea was it? I mean, this is an obvious question. It was, it was Jesus' idea. Let's go to the other side. Why was he taken to the, to the other side? Well, 
Jesus was God in the flesh, and he knew, if you keep reading through Mark 4, on the east side of the sea was a guy that was hurting himself because he was possessed by an evil spirit. And Jesus was taking the disciples to the other side, and Jesus was going to speak healing into this guy's life. And Jesus, being God in the flesh, knew that there would be a storm that also would blow up. Jesus knew that he was taking the disciples on the boat and into and through a storm. And whose idea was it? It was Jesus' idea who knew there would be going into a storm. So from that line of logic, we can say that they were not in the storm because they were out of God's will. They were actually in the storm because they were in God's will. Now, some folks might be confused by this and might be thinking, so you're, you're telling me that God caused this storm? You know, God caused this storm? You know, I can't get into that territory, nor do I believe any human, abil- uh, human being has the ability to 100% of the time describe, did God cause the storm or did God in his sovereignty allow the storm? I cannot tell you that God caused the storm or did God allow the storm, but I can tell you that God always uses the storm to do a work inside of us. In fact, I believe with all my heart, that's why James would say something so powerful as this, that James, the brother of Jesus in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith uh, produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So some of you right now, guess what? You're in the middle of a test. And a good teacher, you know, why, why does a good teacher test you? To pass you and to promote you, right? At the end of the year, you take a final exam, and if you pass the test, you move to the next level. And God, in his love, may be allowing you to experience something, even the testing your faith, promoting you to another level of belief, and this faith produces perseverance, something living inside of you. James, of course, says in verse 4, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God desires for us to be mature and complete. And how how does God mature us? In a lot of different ways. He matures us as we get to know his word and he renews our minds. He matures us as we discover our spiritual gifts and we make a difference in someone else's life. He matures us as we go through certain storms so that God does something in us. In fact, some of you, I would say the difference between where you are and where God ultimately wants you to be is a storm that you have yet to endure. Well, I don't know how many of you know somebody who they've just, they just have a rock-solid faith. Well, I can promise you that they've been through some storms with Jesus. They know his faithfulness. They know his presence. They learn that there is a purpose in every single storm, that God is often doing something in us and teaching us something in the middle of the storm that we couldn't learn in any other way. Again, did he cause it or did he allow it? Again, I don't know, but I do know that always he uses it. Well, the name Vanitha Rendell Risner may not ring a bell to you, but she wrote a book called The Scars That Have Shaped Me, and which is pretty much a book that really fleshes out what this looks like. This idea of God using the storms of life to help shape us to be the people that he has called us to be. Uh, Vanitha has lived a life where she has had storm after storm after storm, and this book is a reflection of all the things that God has taught her from these storms. So let me this morning just share a portion of her story from this book. She says that, I know I've always wanted to be self-sufficient, and I worked hard at it. You know, I contracted polio as an infant in India and was left a quadriplegic after my fever subsided. But after several surgeries, I was able to walk, and after additional operations, became fairly independent. By high school, I had learned to organize my life around my limitations. But going away to college was another major major hurdle, and I wondered how I would how, how I would survive. To everyone's surprise, I learned to adapt. And by the time I graduated, I had figured out how to manage on my own. After a few years of work and then grad school, I got married and had children, grateful that the hardest part of my disability seemed behind me. I was a typical stay-at-home mom, busy caring for my children. I also enjoyed painting, scrapbooking, and making jewelry. 
basically anything I could create with my hands. I started selling my jewelry at a local store, but soon afterward I developed an agonizing pain in my right arm. I went to the doctor and after several months was diagnosed with post-polio syndrome. My arms would never ever recover. The doctor said I needed to reduce the strain on them. Immediately, radically, permanently. I was told post-polio was a degenerative condition that results in an escalating weakness and pain. My energy was like a fixed sum of money in a bank. I could make withdrawals, but not deposits. So, from ev so every time I used that arm, I was losing future strength. From now on, my energy could not be spent on short-term hobbies. I needed to focus on being able to feed myself long-term. Now my arms could only be used for absolute essentials. You know, this, this diagnosis blindsided me, turning my comfortable life upside down. I was a 37-year-old wife and mother with two young children to raise. It was unthinkable that I could one day, maybe even soon, be in a wheelchair full-time, unable to care for myself. How could God do this to me? I wept. How could, how could I handle these new obstacles? Well, I stopped scrapbooking and boxed up my room full of supplies. I gave up painting and making jewelry and canceled my subscriptions to cooking magazines. I made simple meals and entertained less. While all those losses were difficult, losing my independence was the most excruciating. I constantly had to ask for help doing everyday tasks, things I longed to do for myself. For me, the loss of self-sufficiency was humiliating. I hated being dependent on other people, but I had no choice. I started to need help driving long distances, making dinner, occasionally even getting dressed. I had long defined myself as a helper, and I struggled with this role reversal. I didn't want to have needs. I wanted to be needed. I didn't want to be a burden. I wanted to lift others' burdens. I didn't want to be dependent. I wanted to be self-sufficient. Every day I fought against asking for help. I desperately wanted to do things for myself. And I cried constantly. It seemed unfair that ordinary, easy, everyday tasks were now exhausting for me. At first I was angry. Then I grew depressed. I didn't know if I could accept this new life. I pulled away from God. I questioned his goodness and his love for me and figured he wasn't going to answer my prayers anyway. But eventually I realized I could not face this trial without God. I realized I could not face this trial without him. So I finally poured out my heart to him and asked him to help my, me handle my loss as well, to show me how joyful my dependence could look, to give me grace to deal with whatever I was given. And God changed everything. Not by changing my circumstances, but by lighting a path through the darkness. He taught me how to pray, how to ask, how to receive. He gave me glimpses of his glory. He showed me how he is using my circumstances to change me. You know, it was a constant struggle. And she says, if I'm completely honest, it is still a struggle. I think it will always be. Part of me will always long for my independence. But in that longing, I have learned to lean on God in prayer. I have learned how to offer God my honest lament, my anger and grief poured out unedited. I have learned to tell God what's hard and admit that I dread asking for help. I have learned that prayer changes my perspective on my life. Through prayer, I am reminded that heaven is real and one day I will have a new body. Until then, I need to, the, the humility to ask for help. Asking for help is always hard because I'm proud and I'd rather not need anyone. But most people are more than willing to help. They are just waiting to be asked. Sometimes people can't help, and in those situations, I must graciously accept that without getting discouraged and without giving up. The first person I ask is not always the person God has chosen to help. And she closes out by saying this. She says, The entire process is humbling, but this dependence on God and on others has grown my faith in incalculable ways. 2 Corinthians uh, 4, verse 16 and 17 says, So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Though my strength is declining, my faith is growing stronger, and one day I will see what he has done with my suffering. I can show the surpassing worth of Christ when I suffer well. 
when I joyfully accept circumstances that are less than perfect, when I give up my need to control. Willingly relinquishing my need to have things exactly as I want is an act of worship. My faith and my character are not all that has grown through my losses. My friendships and a sense of community has deepened tremendously as well. I've been humbled and amazed at the willingness of others to help, even at great cost to themselves. I see the love of Christ and how he cares for me through the body of Christ. As my physical body is de deteriorating, his body is taking over from mine, showing me with love and unexpected kindness. Kindness I would never have known if I hadn't needed it. Love I would never have experienced if I had refused to ask for help. And she says this at the end. She says, I, as I depend on Jesus more and more, he is gradually tra transforming me into his likeness. There's no one I'd rather depend on. There's no one I'd rather look like. So for Vanitha and for us, when we remember that Jesus is in this boat with us and he wants to use the storm to help us grow in our faith, that changes everything. When we trust in the one who is always present with us, we can walk through any storm. You can go through the storm because Jesus is on the boat. And you can see in this passage this morning that disciples had not gotten to this understanding that Vanitha has learned and as we jump back at the end of the story, we see the disciples are panicking. Jesus, we're going to drown. Wake up, Jesus, wake up. And what does Jesus do? He says, I, I love this. In verse 39, he got up, he rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And the wind died down and it was completely calm. Then Jesus looks at his disciples, why are you guys so afraid? Don't you remember me opening blind eyes, healing deaf ears? Don't you remember that I'm the author of life with you? He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Again, what happened in this passage? Notice what they called Jesus earlier in this passage. They said, teacher, teacher, do you not care if we drown? Teacher, teacher. At this point, Jesus was just their teacher. What did they call him later in the Gospel of Mark? They call him Lord. And here's what happened. The fear of the storm starting to grow into a holy fear of the Lord. I'm like, whoa, who is this? This is amazing. The fear of what might happen to them transformed into a reverential, holy, awe-filled fear of the Lord God. So as we close this morning, a lot of you right now, you're in a storm. You know, if you're a follower of Jesus, I'm going to ask you this question. Why are you so afraid? Can have you forgotten? You're in the storm with the presence of God, and he is for with, he's with you, he's for you. He's working all things to bring about good to those who love him and are called to his purpose. You're in the storm with his presence, and you're in the storm for his purpose. So why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Why am I so afraid at times too? As you, as you get to know this God and he matures you as you grow through some storms and you endure some storms with him, suddenly here's what happens. In the middle of a storm, you can be afraid because the boat looks like it's going to sink, but suddenly your hope is no longer in the boat, but your soul is anchored in the Lord. Your soul is anchored in the Lord because he is on your boat. He is in your house he dwells within you. He is with you. He is for you. Therefore, he has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And that, and that changes everything. We have no reason to fear when Jesus is in our boat. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we pray that in your presence, God, that you would do a healing work, and especially, God, for those who are enduring maybe even a more severe storm than anything we've even talked about, God. We pray that your Holy Spirit would do a work in our hearts that only you can do. God, I hurt with those who are hurting today, and I know, God, that you hurt even more so. But I'm so thankful, God, that, you, that in your sovereign love that you know the details of every single situation. And God, not only do I pray that you would calm the storm as you often can and do, but God, even if you don't calm the storm, I pray that your divine presence would minister peace, a peace that goes beyond our human ability to understand. God, I pray that the power of your Holy Spirit would bring a comfort that only you can bring. 
And God, in your presence, I pray that you, that we could start to even sense a purpose, that you're doing something in us, that you're teaching us something that we couldn't learn in any way, God. In the presence of your Son, God, there is hope, even in the middle of the worst storm. God, help us to cling to Jesus, cling to him, believe that he is enough, And God, I pray for miracles that the storms would pass quickly, that there would be healing, wholeness, forgiveness, restoration, God, that the storms would be still, but even even more so that we would know the everlasting presence and glory of your Son, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.